Yeah, that worked. Okay. Yep, it did. <laughs> and we're back. Another episode of our Wise Words book summaries. I was about to say Wise Words weekly book summaries. Yeah, <laughs> was like, that was the original aim, but we're kind of yeah. we're slowing down a little bit in our old age. Yeah, yeah. We so, get to it eventually. Yeah, we get to it eventually. So today we're doing Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, the classic book on persuasion, I guess. I think. Yeah, I think it's think heralded it's by most businesses. And, you know. Yeah, it's well it's well known in sort of yeah, the marketing departments, etc. Mm. Because of its use, so to speak, in terms of persuading other people. Um, and yeah, what what do you think overall? That I really liked it. I thought it was very clear, um, but not too simplistic. As in, like you know he he backed it up with scientific research but then was able to like make that scientific research consumable for the average joe who doesn't say and interesting yeah. and interesting in a way if that makes sense like oh he, well, yeah, yeah 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 exactly because he explained um, the experiments in a way that's like oh like he was just pitting people in like certain situations and how they would act and i think that's just interesting for people in general because yeah and also a lot of the findings were kind of like i guess you could say like counterintuitive mm. or not obvious and therefore it makes it even more interesting um, exactly kind of breaks that like prediction that you think is gonna gonna occur yeah um, yeah so i really enjoyed it actually and i th- yeah it's it's just a typical kind of early like old school kind of psychology like you know book whereby yeah. now i think there are so many that are built and basically just pick the same stuff from those yeah, kinds yeah. Of from, books and yeah. just regurgitate it i would say his ideas were like book. yeah like you said probably like the bible of it and now people mm-hmm. sort of pick and choose the sort of they take the principles and then try and create like new techniques off it if that makes sense and try and you know yeah. commandeer it as their own yeah. but in reality it's just the same same old mechanisms he's mentioned in this book and it's funny because we both read the the different versions didn't we so I've got yes, like a yeah. like a really updated one. I think it was only updated last year because I remember him saying something along the lines of like in his introduction, he was saying that, you know, it's obviously been a long time since he first pub- pub- published it and that when he originally wrote it, he was very scared to have bad uh, a bad reputation with academics in general because academics don't like when people popularize yeah. um, academic subjects. And he thought, you know, he'd get a lot of backlash from people saying he's dumbing this down. Um but in reality, it it worked out very well for him, and people sort of you know use it as part of their academic studies, etc. So yeah, and I think what's kind of nice is that he comes across quite genuine in in the sense that I think a lot of these books can sometimes be seen as like, well, how can I influence people? You know, how can I manipulate? And like, it it comes from a kind of malicious um, intent rather than. Well, to explain how to not be influenced, you need to explain how influence works. Yeah. Um, and because he's an academic, I think he's probably legit in that sense. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think he generally wants to be able to, um, you know, outline all these principles so that you can then, you know, learn how to say no, as he puts yeah. it. Yeah. But I think a lot of books tend to just be like, they do that just for plausible deniability. You'd be like, no, my main aim was, you know, so that we could get yeah. it. Yeah. Actually. I can't. Yeah. I can't remember if he he definitely has a consultancy gig, like a consultancy company. I think he do lots of businesses. But I remember him saying he does try and catch out nefarious actors using these techniques. Like part of what he does mm. is try and do that. Um be right in terms of the like each chapter I think was probably the same as it was in the original book, which is like the name of the principle, the studies, the idea, and then there's like a bit at the end which is like the reverse of it, like how to avoid being persuaded by these like techniques followed yeah. by a brief, like summary, like a bullet point summary of the ideas. I think, I think that's roughly how yeah. each chapter was running, which is also quite good. Once again, I like, I love books like this with the, with a summary at the end, because you could technically just not read it, uh, not read the chapters and just read the summary at the end and you'll get the main ideas, but you won't get, I guess the underpinning studies, which in my head, um, gives context. the better, yeah create the create a better understanding because you're like oh this works because there was a study that did this and this is how people behaved and this was the reason why rather than just like an idea such as oh you know reciprocating uh, because you know people feel inclined to reciprocate i mean obviously that's the idea itself but like hearing studies where 
people have changed their behavior based upon this principle gives you like, oh, okay, that makes sense. That's why yeah. they did it. Um, yeah. Because obviously all of these, all of the things we're going to talk about today, um, you know, can also be overused and abused to the point where like you come across as disingenuous, like, you know, using some of these tactics and become looking very fake when you do it, it's not going to work. Like you just, because yeah. you know, this tactic doesn't mean you're going to like go around persuading everybody. Um, yeah. There's like a subtle art to this, I guess it's part yeah. of what can be said about it, but. Absolutely. Um, so should we, uh, just get yeah. into it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's just, let's just jump in. So we're going to go from our doc again to try and get some structure. So compliance, what are the factors that make people compliant? So in this book, he identifies six main calls them. You put it categories. I guess it is, it is categories, isn't it? Could also call it principles or whatever. Yeah. They are sort of six overarching yeah, principles that allow people to become more compliant. So you've got some reciprocation, commitment and consistency, social proof, liking, authority, and scarcity. Um, one of his main, I think one of the main points I got from him in the beginning chapters, he talks about the idea that as humans, we're sort of inundated with information. Therefore, we've created these like automatically, auto, sorry, automatic mindless ways of making decisions about things in life. So for example, mm. like, can I trust this person, et cetera, or, or whatnot? Should I buy this product? And a lot of these uh, mindless sort of automatic heuristic slash decisions we make are influenced by these six factors of reciprocation, commitment, consistency, scarcity, et cetera. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And I think it's quite interesting because this book doesn't even, obviously when it was written, you didn't have social media and all that kind of stuff and all this bombarding, like all this information. Yeah, so it's got worse. All the time. So it's yeah, worse, it's yeah. like we're constantly, you know, our cognitive resources are very limited because there's so much bombarding us all the time. And it's quite interesting that, you know, this book and we're reading another one, what age of propaganda, and it doesn't even mm-hmm. talk about that yet. You know, it's like, that wasn't even a, f- a big thing yet. And that book so was, now it's even more which I don't know which one was done first, but you're yeah, right. I know. Know. I've, got like, a fe- yeah. I've got a feeling that age of propaganda. Is- but, but we forget even without the social media and stuff, there was constant bombardment of like advertisements, et cetera, right? Like you get to a bus stop. There's like yeah. many different things that were getting thrown at you. Like a part of yeah. this propaganda sort of movement happened, which is like, I remember there's a book called anxiety makers and like one of the biggest consumerist like things that they realize is if you can make people anxious about certain things, you can sell them solutions. Yeah. So if you can make people anxious about like not being good enough, you can then sell them a solution of being good enough, like making people mm-hmm. anxious about their attractiveness, their beauty, because then they have to find solutions. Yeah. So a lot of this is driven by that. And therefore, if you're anxious 24 seven, you're making all these like minus decisions based upon the people who use these techniques the best. Yeah. Um, no, precisely. Um, and yeah, and these six kind of principles, let's say, um, he basically just weighs them up by seeing how quickly um, and how, you know, was it, um, how quickly they can uh, persuade someone, basically, or influence someone. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of his like metric that he uses to kind of gauge how influential they are. Um, I might quickly just add here, because I got that, that note on the second, the newer edition yes, of the you book. Need to, yeah, yeah where he talks about there are multiple motivations for persuaders. So one of them is cultivating a relationship because if you cultivate a relationship with somebody, they're more inclined to sort of be persuaded by you slash believe what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, A secondary motive for persuaders is reducing uncertainty. So this is when people don't know what to do or don't know what to think. They need to reduce that uncertainty. And then a a third motive of persuaders is motivating action towards what they want. Um, And he basically kind of, associated these principles with specific parts of that of those motivations so for example um he was saying that if you want to build a relationship the primary principles you should be looking at at are reciprocation liking and we can talk about unity later and Mm -hmm. then when it comes to reducing uncertainty if that's the main thing you need to do in an interaction with somebody to persuade them you go towards social proof and authority and then if you're looking to motivate somebody to take an action, you would go, you would lean more heavily on consistency and scarcity. And and that isn't to say they are like exclusive to these objectives. It's more to say they are more fitting to these objectives. Like you're more likely to get somebody to act you know, towards the objective you want by making it sound like it's scarce or making it scarce. They, they want to act rather than being like, oh, because you like me, you should act. Like that's not yeah. very persuasive in comparison to there's only two left. If you don't, if you don't act now, it's going to be gone by tomorrow. Yeah. Um, which one, like, you know, which one's going to change, which one's going to make them act better 
is obviously the scarcity. And it's not to say the other ones can't, you know, influence these other things. It's just, yeah, it's better yeah. fit for purpose, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. It's a general kind of like guideline. And I think this yeah. you can also draw parallels with all the communication books that we've um, uh, summarized as well. You know, there are certain techniques and they're better in certain contexts, but that doesn't mean that they can't be used elsewhere or in other ones. Um, and yeah, and so even kind of what goes on to describe more well, weapons of influence right like how like these methods of influencing people and i thought what was really interesting was this idea of fixed action patterns yeah. this idea that like if you present a specific context or a specific like circumstance to someone then it like unlocks this ability yeah. for them to have like an automatic behavior a kind of default um, yeah and yeah, he gave like an example of like, I think it was like turkey mothers, like they yeah. can only recognize their offspring by them cheeping, you know, like, you know, making a little sound. Um, yeah. But you could take their, their, you know, offspring away and make that sound and they think that you're their child, which is weird, right? It's like just this default um, fault in our programming, you know, just because it's a shortcut. Um, mm. But if people know how to produce those kind of scenarios or, you know, when those shortcuts yeah. are required, then, um, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting, actually. I, I was going to kind of build on that with, like, sort of the evolutionary psychology sort of thinking because a lot of it, mm. you know, they talk about um, how a lot of, if you look out into the animal world, is a, a lot of it revolves around deceptions of these automatic mm -hmm. responses. So, like, yeah. like you said, there's a cheeping. So a turkey, if it hears a cheep, will regardless of what it is go towards it and nurture it like if if for example a predator learned how to cheat like that they would be able to eat unlimited turkeys because the turkeys would keep coming towards them and they yeah. there's plenty of examples like that where it's like i don't know exact ones but like you're talking like insects which have you know patterns on them which make it look like a you know a tasty meal or whatever but in reality yeah. they are going to be eaten because the predator looks like a tasty meal but it's not a meal yeah um and it, it makes me think a lot about this idea of like you know, when like evolution is trying to spare capacity, spare energy, it doesn't think of creating uh, a pattern in these animals' brains to like to act like to think creatively around that sort of situation. Like, overcome okay, it, yeah. yeah, to overcome a cheap, but because for them, reliably in the past, a cheap equals their baby turkey. So therefore, yeah. it doesn't come up with a way of like evaluating is this cheap real? Yeah. Does that makes sense. And, and yeah. I, I think we take for granted our ability to like reevaluate but at the same time we also don't and we also act in ways that are like pre-programmed bit like what you're saying here where we don't even realize we're acting in these ways yeah because we haven't really thought about it and we just we go into automatic response mode to specific things like i think yeah. one of the examples he gave was like we have an automatic response mode to when somebody gives us a reason for something so like he did an experiment with the photocopier can you remember it where it was like you have to push in there's a queue of people waiting to queue for a photocopier like i don't yeah. know how many long like six or seven and so there's like pressure on the first person. You go up to the first person saying like, I really need to use your photocopier. And then oh, yeah, yeah. the other experiment was, I really need to use a photocopier because I need to copy my photos. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. the reason's like non-existent, but yeah, the yeah, amount yeah. of compliance that went up was like from like 10% to like 60% or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I probably butchered that. the percentages, but it was like a massive increase just because they said, because I need to do it. And I yeah. think what's more interesting is, is made me think because like, what you do immediately when you hear the word because you just think they've got a good reason so you go yeah sure yeah. No, no worries and i, I think uh, yeah, what I happens though, you then sit there and you go hang on a second they just said because they're doing photocopiers but then yeah, but then yeah. you don't want you don't want unless you're that type of person you don't want to have the combat so you kind of just go like, yeah. oh, i've already i've already told them they can do it now and yeah that's how you do it <laughs> no it is it's so interesting and i think that these these i think um when people use these influential kind of techniques it takes advantage of like an almost impulsive, like like we said, automatic behavior. And it's because it, I wonder if someone was to go up to you and say, because, and then the reason didn't trump your reason, would you still react in a very automatic behavior? Um, Is it, yeah, because, but do, do you, yeah. I do agree, by the way, because a lot of this was, I, I'm trying to think, was it done? I guess you'd have to know how this was done, right? You'd have to know, was so, there yeah. massive, like this front person, what was their reasoning for using the photocopy? Because you're right, if they yeah. were late and they really had to go somewhere in the next 10 minutes, they were like already behind. They, yeah. I mean, if it was me, I would just go like, hey, no, I really have to do this because I'm 10 minutes yeah, late. Yeah. So maybe you can ask the person behind me. 
Yeah. So you got to get what I mean. Well, it's like, so it's like, like bit, you know, when you're in a queue and you're like queuing for like about an hour and you're so yeah. sick of queuing and then someone says something, you're like, no, I don't care. I can't but that, that's right that's now, a good point, you know, and that right, is a, yeah. a lot of the reason why some of these like you know experiments can never really do real life because there's so many more variables than just people queuing. There's yeah. how do people feel in this queue? Why are they in the yeah. queue in the first place? But I think the overall overarching thing was like if you give a reason, you're more likely to be accepted, I guess, or your your request is more likely to be accepted. Yeah, even if it's a stupid reason, just because you said because. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's weird, and, and arguably, yeah, you would be better off in a situation where there's less pressure on the person at the front, where they're kind of like you know moping around, they don't give a fuck. Like, like if you're in a chilled mode, like you're like you're saying, if you're like sort of chilled about it, then yeah, it's fine. But if you've got a reason yourself to be pushing to the front, then of course you're going to say no in my head. That's almost yeah. like a given. Yeah, but. and and I think you know most of these um, techniques or principles they're kind of rooted in this idea that it's it's how much cognitive resources you can apply to like scrutinizing something you know we don't go around life all the time scrutinizing everything because we wouldn't get anywhere you know mm-hmm. and so you have to have shortcuts we have to have heuristics like you said and yet yeah, these basically just take advantage of them and i think he mentions what is it like three like all the all of these six i'm just going to read out these three things that all six of these principles share so Mm-hmm. Um, a nearly mechanical process by which the power within these weapons can be activated, the consequent uh, consequent exploitability of this power by anyone who knows how to trigger them, and a third component involves the way that um, the weapons of automatic influence lend their force to those who use them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it was quite much- interesting because he, he gave like a metaphor throughout the book of this jujitsu, isn't it? This mm. idea of... Um, you know, it's like moving and shaping and flexing things rather than like taking a full on, like full front. You know, if you want to be able to, um, if you want to be able to influence someone, then it's like changing their energy or like being able yeah, to yeah. You know, maneuver it and so that it's in the correct place. When Using their like their energy in a way yeah. that like you don't have to like brunt force go against it. You like yeah, you know, with jujitsu you like throw yeah. people over when they like come at you, don't you? You use their own like, yeah. weight against them, etc. Weight against them, exactly. Yeah. And then next, I think we got here. So the, before we get into some of the principles, we had the the contrast principle. Um, oh yeah, that and that's just simply like this one was a bit of a weird one because it mm. does it's not really a principle like in the sense it was one of those categories, but at the same time it's a very overarching general principle of persuasion, I guess to a degree. Is when you contrast something to something else, the differences stand out, and obviously the more difference different they are the more this stands out so like yeah. one of the examples they were giving here was like you know the idea of spending 95 dollars on a sweater if they just bought a 495 suit is a bit different than just buying a 95 dollar sweater immediately because you've already yeah. rationalized spending that much money and that's why yeah. car companies i've heard do a lot of like you know you buy a car for like i don't know 10k let's just say and they give you lots of add-ons for like 50 100 150 and you think oh well i've already spent 5k i'm not as who cares about the next whereas if somebody literally said to you straight up like would you take 150 for this you'd probably be like no well think about flights right like think about when you buy a flight you've just bought a flight for 400 pounds to go wherever and then they're like do you want to book um, a hotel you know it's like 50 quid 60 quid yeah like well yeah but if you had yeah. booked a flight for sixty quid, then would you really spend another sixty quid on something like? Yeah, um, I, f- I find contrast principle is quite interesting because I remember it being used for habits. I want to say it was Atomic Habits that brought it up. Mm. Whereas, like, think like let's just say if it's a money habit you wanted to do, you wanted to change, try and rephrase the money that you're about to spend on something towards something you'd like. So I remember it. there was a, there was a stage where I was like, you know, I like let's just say you dropped, you went out for dinner and you dropped fifty quid on a dinner, you'd be like, well. I like reading books. I could buy 10 books for five quid. I could have 10 books or I could have this dinner. And when you start doing that, you get the pain. And that's personally yeah. why I avoid thinking about spending money because if you think <laughs> too much about it, you could recontextualize it in any way you've like, if I thought about some of the stuff I've wasted maybe on drinking alcohol in my life for the fact that all you really get is obviously a fun time and a hangover. Uh, you could be like, wow, I could have like, you know, this is how much I could have bought alternatively. So like, yeah, it's one of those things, but the power of it is real. If you think about it, like recontextualizing, contrasting something to something else, as long as the contrast kind of makes sense as well. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And I think, I think the reason why it's not so much an influential um, technique is that it's just, 
a, a psychological function, a way yeah. that we think. About well, it's the only things. way. It's the way we perceive, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Like I remember, yeah. did I talk to you about that? The book, The Other Minds, or whatever, where it talked about the very initial yeah. stages of perception of a cell, and essentially the very initial stages of like a cell. This is before brain, etc. Is literally perceiving a change around them. So contrasting yeah. what's happening around the cell now. So like, is the is it more acidic? In comparison, yeah. like to what it was before, and it has like a, that's how memory was first introduced. Like, is oh, there a change? No. Yeah, yeah, literally like that. So, therefore, like the first primary elements of perception are related to like change and contrast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's quite cool. Cool. Well, I think that's the initial beginning bit, and we're probably on good time. I think so. Let's let's yeah, jump in. So. so, I think you these notes are in the same same order as. The initial bit, right? So it's reciprocity, it, yeah. Reci- reci- reciprocity. How would you even? Pr- yeah, reciprocity. Reciprocity principle. Yeah. Um, the rule in general says that we should try to repay in kind what another person has provided with us. Uh, provided to us. Oh yeah, we are human because our ancestors learned to share their food and their skills in an ordered network of obligation. Yeah, this is. It's quite interesting because when I first read this book, I never picked up on this bit. But obviously, since mm. reading a lot of like evolutionary psychology, it became more like, oh, okay, yeah, now I see why he's yeah. saying this about this, like, you know, recipro- like reciprocity wise, like built into us because it could just make sense. We've evolved from, you know, one of the most collaborative species there is on the planet. And yeah. one of the ways we are wired to collaborate is by uh, reciprocating favors and keeping track of favors we've done to then make sure people who don't reciprocate favors get like ousted essentially yeah, that's part of absolutely. part of our, our wiring right and that's why i remember i think it was the Orig- origins of virtue i don't know if you ever did it, yes, for it. Yeah, yeah. but they did talk a lot about how we have like better cognitive functions at detecting cheats that we do like maths because our brain just prefers these equations of like yeah. human action than it does for you know uh yeah. Uh, maths. I mean, I guess you could just look at culture in general. We watch movies, which is humans put in tough situations and yeah. relationship questions rather than you watching mathematical sequences. Because if we were really programmed to want to watch maths, we would, you know, we'd do it, but we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, it, it, it is interesting. And like, you know, it's not even just a human property. It's, you know, you see it in monkeys when they um, yeah. like pick um, uh, lice off, off another one. But then the other one will expect them not. And this is the interesting part. It doesn't have to be the same exact gift. Yeah. You know, it could be something else. It's like if you scratch my back, I'll come and fight for your tribe. You know, it's like because everybody has different. different, But yeah, I was going to say everybody has their own different like skills, properties, you know, whatever. So like you're very good at this. You provide this. I provide this for you. You know, this is like this is the very primitive, I guess, economy, right? Like we're in a clan. I provide the, I don't know, I provide, I go out and, I was going to say go out and hunt, you provide food or whatever, like you provide, I don't know, the vegetables, so to speak, or whatever, but you, yeah. somebody provides the clothes, somebody provides this, and you all do your bit for the team, like before money was invented, that was, I can imagine how everything kind of worked itself yeah. out, right? And um, it's interesting how deeply embedded that is in us, because one of the yeah. points that you mentioned was that, yeah you don't even have to like the other person or you could dislike the other person, but you still feel obligated to reciprocate. Um, And that's why I think people can take advantage of it because like, you know, they know that this is just something so ingrained. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Because it's like, like, one of of the um, main examples you use was when uh, you get given something by someone on the street and then they expect you to give something back. I was going to mention, I've just come back from Paris right? because they literally, yeah. there were so many people yeah. doing that. Like, you know, like the roses, they walk around yeah, with roses yeah, yeah. and they give you a rose. They're like, oh, it's free, it's free. And they give it to you and they're like, oh, pay me. And it's like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, yeah. Except yeah. They're, they're a bit less tactful because usually it would be like, yeah. you know, they wouldn't ask you to pay, but yeah, it's, it's that classic. It's, yeah, you yeah. give something with the expert or not, don't, well, you don't give it with the expectation, but a lot of people do use it a bit like, I think another example they gave was like, you know, in, in car dealerships, they give you like free coffees, teas, etc. Because they're trying to like not sweeten it, but they're trying to show that they care about you. They're willing to like you know give you give you things. Yeah. Um, I thought. Well, yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, go on. No, I was going to say we we spoke about just before this call, uh, but just before the podcast, um, about that example of the birthday cards, which is there was an experiment done, or was it? I didn't even know if it was an experiment, was it? I think it might have no, been. No, I think it was just an example. Was, of some yeah, just an example. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, so there was that salesman. Yes, he always used to keep in contact with people, and he was like the best salesperson because he always just used to keep it like keep sending people like birthday messages. But I think the example he gave was something like he a random kid, or maybe it was his kid, sent out to all the neighbors like Merry Christmas cards, and then they received like loads of Christmas cards back because people felt the obligation to reply, even though they didn't know this kid. Like yeah, they, nobody yeah. knew who this person was, but they replied yeah. because of the fact they received a Christmas card. And they felt they had to they had to repay the favor, which is quite interesting because that's I guess once again how do you build a friendship or how do you start from when you don't know whether to trust each other right like let's yeah. just say you bump at somebody on the street you don't know like because you never met this person you like how would you know how to behave but if they do something kind mm. to you like they pick up something you've dropped or they say oh here you go I don't need this here's a ticket you remember that person you want to be friends with them like you said you don't even yeah. need to like them because I feel like the prerequisite for liking could even be the first initial here's here's something oh you give it's me like something a trade. oh now we're friends yeah yeah, yeah but like no, like that, it, uh, yeah, that comes liking comes almost like obviously you can like people before that but liking tends to come after when you've like both accepted a few different things from each other and realized oh this is like you know this is beneficial and i'll like your company or whatever yeah. um no 100 because I, I don't think you're ever going to like someone who you know is deceptive or a cheat and i think yeah. at the very crux it doesn't matter what you know uh, how big the trade is to a degree okay even if you just say like when you say hello to someone and they say hi back right people who don't say hi back you're like oh god they're a bit they're in a fucking yeah. mood they're in this you know it's like the most basic exchange of behavior but actually i guess that goes to t- it starts telling you like oh this person seems like he can reciprocate this is someone yeah, who yeah. you know that on a larger level they would probably reciprocate as well um yeah. and yeah and it's interesting because like he gives two like reasons why why we have to why we feel like obligated to return a favor and one of them being that like it kind of causes this psychological burden it's like when we talk mm. about cognitive dissonance it's like this psychological um uncomfortability and and then the second one is like because we don't you know those who violate the rules are disliked by a social group and so we wouldn't want to tarnish ourselves by association with someone who you know cheats um Mm -hmm. and yeah it's 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 just so funny how like deeply ingrained it is like we hate someone like yeah like you don't you don't choose but you also don't choose to feel these ways it's kind of why like there's that argument for like um the sort of biological structure of like motivation in a way because like you don't choose to be motivated in this way you literally just feel the the pain of like having to give the debt back right does that make sense like no person in their right mind could would logically choose to have that because they then they know they'd be able to be taken advantage of. But we all feel yeah. the same thing when people give us gifts, and this is kind of the yeah. reason why you were saying earlier on with the um, you know, it's open then for exploitation. A bit like these animals, like the insects who, you know, have the patterns which attract uh, prey. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like people can game these systems of reciprocation to get people more people to comply, and yeah. there's plenty of people who will use that. Um, yeah, and no, but that's where on. it's quite yeah. interesting. That's where it's quite interesting because he mentions that there's an obligation to give, an obligation to receive, and an obligation to repay. And he mm. starts talking about this conceding, doesn't he? And how, yeah, you know, w- you know, just because that, just because we we don't want to come across as the bad guy, we don't want to create enemies um, by just saying no all the time. And so, if we make someone else say no, then we feel like we also have to lose something as well, right? Yeah. Like we have to incur a cost, which is uh, we have to concede. Um, and he starts talking about um, this, you know, how you can make someone concede to something. Well, yeah, yeah. Do you want to explain this bit? Yeah, no, it's just, well, I guess you could just think of conceding, like conceding as a, as a, a conce- well, as a concession, as a way of reciprocal, or as a way of trying to gain reciprocity so like yeah. if you want a specific price for a good let's just say as an example and this person says no they can't afford it so you then concede so you're basically giving them a gift because you're conceding something that you originally yeah. wanted because you've originally stated you wanted something you're gonna say actually no fine i won't i won't get the full amount i want i will offer you this you can give them a reason i guess be because i like you or whatever and then yeah. because you've conceded more often than not the other person will concede because 
they have seen that you conceded and that you're willing to like, they want to reciprocate the concession. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't work all the time. And I like, I mean, I guess if you really look into like what negotiation really is, is it's trying to both get to the point where both of you have put your like sort of positions on the table of what you're willing to accept and then conceding yeah. down to the point where you both agree on terms. Yeah. Cause that literally is what it is. Like, you know, for example, I can see, let's just say you want to, buy something from me i concede to a price but it's still way above what you're willing to buy it for yeah. do we then enter a negotiation of mutual conceding and finding terms that we can both agree on um yeah but yeah the the whole this whole reciprocation using concessions it was i found pretty interesting just because it's 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 one of those things that you know you haven't even had to give a gift you've kind of like you've offered them something for less or you've you've shown that you've reduce your desire for something you wanted to do them a favor if that makes sense yeah yeah um yeah it's 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 really interesting especially how like because this is also talking about how we perceive what a concession is right mm. we're not talking about how much someone is actually conce um, conceding and that's the difference and he was saying that you know the first the first offer that you make doesn't have to be that different from the second offer or the second offer doesn't have to be that different from the first yes yeah, it it's just, just needs like, to look yeah. like you're like conceding yeah 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 and that's what like you said it could even be like like a price change of like i don't know let's just say it's two quid it's like negligible price change depending on yeah. what the good is but it's like oh you conceded like 0.1 percent, but you've still conceded and they feel like exactly. they've won exactly or they feel like yeah. they've been given something that's not really Oh yeah, but they you've given them something that wasn't available before. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um exactly, and that's why you know what he talks about in terms of a lot of salesmen, they'll start with something that they don't actually genuinely think that you would ever take. Mm. It's just so that they can get the first one out of the way so that then they can make it seem like they've conceded and that you're willing to go for yeah, the actual yeah. price that they want you to go for. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%. I I feel like a lot of a lot of businesses operate off that principle to be fair yeah. like it just makes sense to give a higher price and then offer the ability to reduce that price and obviously make it look like it's a deal yeah because obviously everybody who comes into contact with them is like, oh my god i got a deal like i don't know i feel like it's always worthwhile right like if you're listening to this to just if yeah. you're let's just say you think you're buying anything or like a software or whatever just messaging their customer service being like hey can you give me a deal because half the time as a business owner i will just say yes because if you know your margins well enough you'll know that you can potentially offer a bit of a discount and it's just these people that if they ask you to, that people tend to give them yeah um, yeah like th they're always up for negotiation to a degree oh that's what i believe at least i tell you what yeah. i thought the other day i happened to be on the tube and on the overgram especially and you get a lot of homeless people who come down asking for money mm. and i was thinking like obviously most most people don't actually give any money but it's interesting because if you were to apply this principle and be like, can any, does it, can anyone spare any money? And people say no. But then if they were to then be like, well, do you have any advice on what I should do to get myself out of this predicament? Yeah. I guarantee you those people would feel, because people feel guilty already not giving yeah. money. And I they don't people, make eye contact. Interesting like enough that. as well, you mentioned that principle bit, like the concession thing. People don't like saying no too many times. Like, yeah, if yeah. you just like, do you have any of this? No. Do you have any of this? No. You feel like a dick. Yeah, if you yeah. say no about three times, you just feel like a douche, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have... <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, you're right. Like, how do you ever... Do you have any advice? Do you know where I can stay tonight? Do you know where I'll... You know, do you know where I can find yeah. somebody who might send me some money? <laughs> I don't know. Anything. Yeah. Anything that's a bit... You're right. Just... Yeah. It's, if you it's, get it's... the first rejection, you just reduce the second ask, right? Yeah, I've didn't it was it this book where he talked about sp asking for specific amounts? Or was that not? Uh, I think I've that's something like that, that, uh, thinking fast and slow, Could where you change the the anchor of what people. Because if yeah, I start so, at two hundred, yeah. then you're okay with like one hundred and eighty. It was, it was less you, the you anchor. Change that. It was more oh, like really? just a homeless person. The best way to get money would be a specific amount because oh, okay. you you suggest or like it was something like oh can I have eighty nine p to get a sandwich because it's more specific yeah. and it you know where it's going then just give because me some change you just gave a reason yeah mm -hmm. true i think yeah exactly that could be it more than the actual specific amount um but i think also and we'll talk about this later but you know when you were talking about um sit um 
isolating someone when you need help yeah. when we were talking about that kind of pluralistic ignorance i wonder if it's like being specific about something means that people don't have ambiguity about trying to think up of how they're going to respond because they've okay. been given a way to respond i don't know but um okay yeah no we'll get on to that then well yeah. which one is that are uh, that's which one is that in that's social proof no social Authority? Proof, i think yeah okay yeah. I think, uh, do you want to touch on this how to say no part so we can finish off this? Um, yes, this I just have one more point on, okay. on, the, on reciprocity. And it was quite interesting because they were saying that basically if I make you concede, or no, if you make me concede, so I offer you something and you say you can't do it, and then it looks like I've conceded, right? So it looks like out of my will, I'm happy to be like, okay, that's fine. And he was talking about how that makes you have positive feelings towards me because it means like I'm happy uh, to accept that concession. Because you're so sacrificing then, basically for me. Like you're, you've made a sacrifice exactly. for me, therefore I like you more. Like, or like, yeah, I have more positive exactly. feelings. Exactly. So it creates that shown. positive yeah. attitude. And, it's, and, and, then, and then what's even more interesting is because you feel like you owe me, okay, you also feel like you're the one driving the deal. And I thought that was really interesting because it's as if you've taken the responsibility. I'm not even in charge of this deal anymore. You're in charge of it. And so you're actively trying to um, go for the second deal because you your your attitude towards me. And yeah, yeah. I conceded on the first offer. I thought that was super interesting. Just how you can no, no. change the frame of who's actually in control in a sense. Oh, no, it is. I'm sure the master yeah. persuaders all do that type of thing. Yeah. Because if I make you think like you've got control in a situation, then I'm yeah, yeah. Of course. When it, yeah, um, exactly. especially if you've, you've done it on purpose, right? Yeah. It kind of reminds me a bit of never split the difference. Mm. But um, Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, moving on to how to say no. Um, so this next bit is, uh, what was one of the things that he was saying? So... Yeah, so accept them for what they are. So when people give you a gift, when that person gives you that rose in the street and expects something back, well, you just accept it for what it was. It was a gift initially. Then they changed the meaning of it once they gave it to you and they were like, well, give something back. You know, I'm expecting some reciprocity here. But a way to get out of that is to be like, well, no, you gave it to me as a gift. If you don't want to, then take it back. But Yeah, I quite like, I quite like that rebuttal. It's quite cool. Should have done that in yeah. Paris. You gave me that rose. <laughs> Did you end up buying it? No, not at all. I just, no, I, I, yeah. I already knew what they're trying to do, so I didn't even get anywhere near them. Yeah. Um. Um. And I quite like this one you got here, which is you can determine what the requester retreats do to find a second request. I quite like that because mm. then it puts you in the like. See, it's a bit like the negotiation stuff. Like, oh, I can give you a price of twenty-two, but like, look, I really can't do that. I can get, tw- I'll give you nineteen. Take yeah. it or leave it. Like you know. And then it's like, yeah. you know. Then you've defined where your sort of position is, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like yeah. that one. I thought that was quite cool. Um, okay, so should we go on to the next yeah. one? Yeah, commitment and consistency, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So, our early, what, so what's it say here? Our early obsessive desire to be and to appear consistent with what we have already done. Once we have made a choice of taking a stand, we encounter personal, interpersonal pressures to behave consistently with that commitment. Okay. I mean, it's fairly obvious that we want to come across as consistent people. And I believe that's mainly driven by the fact that, you know, if you're an inconsistent person, people are probably going to be scared of you. Yeah. And when I'm saying inconsistent, I'm not like inconsistent in terms of like times you're turning up. I mean, inconsistent in behavior where, you know, what, what, what do people call these people? Like crazy people, essentially. It's people who are unpredictable, so to speak, right? Yeah. So there's a level of, we are biologically wired to want to behave consistently. And that's why he says the personal interpersonal level here, isn't it? Cause it's personally, I guess you need to behave consistently just so you can build up a, a very congruent story of yourself in your head. And then interpersonally mm-hmm. it's, if you don't behave in a consistent manner, people won't probably be friends with you. Um, and likewise, it's like if others don't yeah. act in a consistent way, why would you want to do trade with them on like a basic you know, evolution? Yeah. Scale? In fact, yeah. In fact, you even got this note here. I just, inconsistency is commonly thought to be an undesirable personality trait the person whose beliefs words and deeds don't match uh may be seen as indecisive confused two-faced or even mentally ill yeah um, yeah it's interesting isn't it it's, it's 
Okay. And I, yeah, yeah. I got, look at the this note as well. I, f- I forgot about this bit. Is it? It's it, it as it appears. Automatic consistency functions as a shield against thought. It should not be surprising that such consistency can see can be exploited by those who would prefer that we not to think too much. Shield against thought. That's quite interesting. Like I've made this decision. I've acted this way in the past, so now I don't have to think yeah. about it because I've already committed to this decision. I find it. I find it quite interesting, and I don't know whether this was touched on in the book, but for example, if I make a purchasing decision and it's a big decision, I will go out and watch videos to convince myself of my decision. I'll be like, yeah, reviews yeah, of this yeah. product, and it, probably only the good ones, realistically. Yeah, I'll be like, yeah, you know, do yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? It's, yeah. I'm always forever doing that. Like, if I've done something, I'm like, I want, I want somebody to reassure me that I've done the correct decision, and this kind of reminds me of it a little bit. I don't well, know they, if they, they have that, um, they have that famous study, you mentioned that famous study of um measuring people's confidence in their bets on horse oh, yes. horse racing before yeah. and after they made the bet yes. and they were obviously way more confident after they had actually put money down because they have to convince themselves that their behavior was right it's, it's the um it's that rationalizing instinct isn't it it's like we make yeah. decisions and then we come up with reasons for it and i think these reviews uh, these reasons then convince yourself of yeah. the decision being like logical and well thought out yeah. that makes sense like you you act kind of based on a whim and then you con- then you then convince yourself that that was there was a reason for it yeah. um and like a good reason for it yeah um, exactly exactly um it's quite funny just how we do it with literally everything um and we just constantly justify everything because comfort like trumps truth or comfort yeah. or safety and we like to know that like oh we did what we did for a reason you know there was we were justified in our behavior rather than like if we were to actually scrutinize our but uh, scrutinize our behavior and be like why the fuck did we do that you know because then that makes us feel bad and we're like oh shit should i have made a different decision why did i act like that that's so embarrassing like and it's funny like i'm thinking about it now you know when you're drunk and you do like mm. really embarrassing kind of behavior and then the next well, day, when you're so you just usually your brain will like uh, stop you from acting specific ways, right? Like it's not like yeah. you actually are acting really embarrassed. I mean, I'm really embarrassing. Well, I don't know. Sometimes, like on a night out, I I will justify certain behavior, and it will yeah. be. And then the next day, when I see it, when I'm sober, I'm like, "What the fuck? Why did yeah, I yeah. do that?" It's like I didn't what? think about it, you know. But yeah, that's exactly what alcohol does, though, isn't it? It stops yep. you from thinking about it <laughs> in the moment, yep. I guess, or stopping yourself from doing specific things. Yeah. Um, and I think yeah. it's about making those decisions because once you take a stand, you're pretty stubborn. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you've already decided that that's how you're going to be, or that's the behaviour that you want to do. Um, and yeah, and then you, you, you once again, you find all those things that will justify it. Um, and that's normally whether we, you know, have a thought, an idea, behavior, feeling, etc. But it's like mm. once we commit to something, once we yeah. invest and put cognitive resources to choosing something, then we're much more likely to be stubborn about changing. Yeah, we should re- we should read that decisive book again. Or I don't mm. know if we do we ever read it the first time. We should definitely review that soon. It's just reminding me of it in terms of. I, I put it on my about... um. I put it yeah. on my arms and literally yesterday, I think, actually. Because I think they talk a lot about, like, be careful what you decide, right? And I think he talks about it a lot yeah. in this book as well. Be careful what you decide because you will find out that what you decide to do will end up influencing your future decisions. Because yeah. usually yeah. they act congruently with what you've decided to do in the first place. Um, yeah. I mean, we can go into some of these examples here. I'm looking at this. So, like, the Chinese getting confessions for the American troops. Mm-hmm. So this was to do with, like the mix of also private commitments and public commitments. So obviously we talked earlier about this like interpersonal and, and personal sort of like motivations. So we talked about the personal being like, you know, you act in a way and then your brain ra- rationalizes to yourself why you did it. So that's like your personal motivation to keep that story congruent in your head. Yeah. And the interpersonal yeah. one is obviously like you say something in front of your friends and then you feel motivated to have to like either explain why you did it or you have to do the same behavior again, because otherwise you look like somebody who, I don't know, you know stood for something but like you're a flake now because you you don't stand for it anymore right like yeah, you did something yeah. in the past but now you don't because you're you're not you know uh consistent um but they had that really interesting way that the chinese uh interrogated american soldiers i think wasn't it and it was something yeah. on the lines of like they would get people to write even so not even like what their thoughts were on communism 
but get people to start copying out on a board like the pros of communism. Yeah. So they slowly over time copying. be writing it. Yeah, literally just copying it. So not even coming from their head. They would then also then publish those those written papers in front of their comrades to like show that these people are like making statements about it, yeah. whatever, I think. But over time, these people started becoming more positively because they started learning, I guess, the positive connotations that they were being reading or being taught or whatever. Yeah. And then slowly over time, they chipped away and they became relatively consistent not to the point where they'd be like fuck like fuck america but i believe they completely changed their mind on china yeah. as before it was the enemy and now it was ah, oh, not so bad it's you know and i thought that was a really yeah. interesting way because you've got to hear down as like uh corruption 101 like the small consistent steps and yeah yeah but that's it it's like you know it's it's the action and i think it's much easier to change a belief than an action and once you know a lot of the time we actually get our beliefs from our actions from our behavior but if mm. you think about it you know you behave in a certain way now you can either go back and jeopardize your your reputation by being like oh no i didn't want to be like that i want to be like this which shows that you're kind of inconsistent or you change your belief to match up with your behavior and i think that's what was kind of going on in these like prison uh, prison of war camps is that they were slowly one like bit by bit change like doing these actions and then and then those um essays that were written were like pronounced in front of all of the other inmates so then there was like a public stance and they had to in line they had to, their belief and their behavior had to kind of um be in line with what uh what they had written and that's what's like crazy is that you know even just the tiniest little bits like you said like copying down certain things from the board even if you don't believe it but it's like you have it to all be influences in line you with somehow behavior. away right like it all everything's slowly like changing yourself or changing yeah. you um, and that's what it, um cognitive dissonance is it's like when there's a discrepancy between your belief and your behavior or thoughts and feelings and you know all that kind of stuff because it builds this psychological tension once again and yeah. you want to be rid of that and so you'll do anything to kind of change either action or belief but most likely belief because it's easier to change um mm -hmm. I'm just Which, looking yeah, at your, your bit here that you wrote here. This is well, way more eloquent than what I was trying to say a second ago. So the in, the personal motivation from the inside, there is a pressure to bring the self-image into line with action. And then from the outside, there is a sneakier pressure, to uh, a tendency to adjust this image according to the way others perceive us. I quite like mm. that. Um, yeah, very much. And I, I think one of the most important things that they said about this is that they didn't punish them and they didn't reward them because it had to come from them. And I think yes, yeah, 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 from ge that, yeah. genuine, they, it has to be integral because Isn't, they take doesn't responsibility. It, yeah, doesn't it remind you a lot of the uh, how to have impossible conversations where it's like the goal isn't to change their <laughs> mind. It's the goal is to get them to change their own mind by providing them yeah. reasons to change their own mind. Like your, your goal is to instill doubt. Like that is yeah. it. And I guess that's what you could even argue this, this, Chinese method was doing it was instilling yeah. doubt of their own beliefs by making them act in a way that doesn't it was wouldn't be congruent with the Chinese of the enemy when you're writing pro yeah. communist you know essays you know and yeah, then they precisely. have to like you said without without in a way that yeah they come to their own conclusions over time right yeah which yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, I find that so interesting but it, it, it uh, that's what I picked up in this book is that because learning 101 is like if you learn for an incentive then you're only gonna learn for an incentive and if you learn because mm. of a um because of fear then you're either only learning because of fear or you're going to end up rebelling and they talk about reactance theory later on in the book um but so it has to come from you it has to be integral it has to you have to have responsibility for your own decisions for your own behavior i thought that was super interesting um and if you I can do provide like this, that yeah. as an influential technique, then it works. You know? Yeah. Well, it's the best influence, isn't it? Because not only have you influenced somebody, but they haven't even realized they've been influenced because they feel like they come from it from their own accord. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They've decided themselves that this is the sort of... They, like, they're not being forced to believe something, like threatened to believe something or to act yeah. in a way. Um, what else have you got here, by the way? I think because we didn't touch on the... the, the, um, no, the go, yeah. There was another bit that um, it was talking about how the more effort you put into yeah. um, a, a decision, 
then the more likely you are to justify that. And he talks about like kind of tribal behavior or like initiations, like fraternities. And it yeah. is, it does make yeah. a lot of sense, doesn't it? It's like, you know, you've committed a lot to this. So you yeah. have to and you weasel out you weasel out people who aren't committed as well, right? Like yeah. you weasel out yeah, people no, who aren't committed to the cause, which is why you know you have army initial um initiations, etc. It's all part of like yeah, test I guess like you just said, it's just yeah. testing commitment to the cause. And obviously yeah. the more the more grueling the 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 test is, the more likely you are to be like, why would you then get in the thing and be like, oh this is shit, I don't want to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah exactly. I just, you know, if you're a uni student, I've just, you know, I don't know, ate somebody's puke or whatever the hell they do these days. Like, why, yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm going to leave now after doing all that horrendous yeah, stuff. Oh, it's like, um, yeah, no, what you were just saying then, so you got here. So it appears that commitments are the most effective in changing a person's self-image and future behavior when they are active, public and effortful. Yeah. Uh, but there is another effective. Uh, there's another property of effective commitment that is more important than the other three combined. The behavior should be internally fueled and not under duress yeah. or incentivized. Okay, yeah. And that's what yeah, we're saying. Was yeah, it has to be integral. Yeah, and that's what you're saying. It about. is. It is accepting that responsibility, isn't it? And yes. I think that's why they feel more likely to follow through and justify their behavior because they've accepted that they've taken on that responsibility. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting because that reminds yeah that does remind you of the the boys wasn't it? It was something like wasn't it to do with the marshmallow? Yes, no, it was, yeah, it was, I think it was to do with no was marshmallow it? or a toy. It was like the toy, the toy. It was like one of them was like you can't play with that toy, otherwise we'll like beat the crap out of you or something along those lines. And then another one was <laughs> well, like, you think a researcher is going to do that? Actually, maybe they do. Maybe well, they no, do it was that. it was it was like a force. It was like a forceful, like a, it was like a pain induced punishment, I believe. It was, yes. it was something more it wasn't nice uh and then yeah. the other one was kind of like if you play with that toy it's, it's bad. wrong yeah it's wrong yeah. yeah and then they found out that the in the next experiment or the next time they had the choice of which toy to play with the ones who were like forced to not play with the toy played with the toy more often than not and the ones who got told it was bad have then internalized and decided it's bad which is it's really interesting because you could then really get on a rabbit hole of like controlling a population's beliefs because once you indoctr- indoctrinate them to believe specific things they then don't do you get what i mean like moral yeah, codes no, but- passed down through schooling systems etc right like yeah it's it's i do personally sit on a stance where i think there is a level of like morality that's like ingrained like there mm-hmm. is certain things that are right or wrong no matter what human like like university across human like different yeah. areas of humanity across the world where people have been separate they still come to the same rules and moral code yeah. but there is stuff that's open to interpretation right like so, some morals are like yeah and it's how you change how you teach it is yeah it? because like so for instance this the reason why the boys who were going to be punished if they touched the toy ended up touching the toy is mm. because of this thing called reactance theory And reactance theory basically suggests that if a behavior to do something is under threat, if the freedom to to behave in a certain way um, is under threat, then you're more likely to do it. It it creates the opposite effect in that sense. Um, And there was a really interesting point that I hadn't come across before that he said in his book. And it was talking about what is perceived as a threat because okay. each individual is different. And so threats can be very different. And there was like one part in the book, I'm not sure if I um, made a note on it, but it was like this girl um, being told multiple different threats for doing something. And like some weren't perceived as a threat and some were, but to a different kid, that threat would be considered a threat. Do you get what I mean? So it's like okay. you have to be able to gauge like – what you're able to say to a child in terms of like parenting, like what you're okay, able yeah. to tell a child um, and whether it would be considered something that would in- elicit a reactance like approach or whether it would just be considered like the, you know, but you're right. Cause you yeah. Know? Some kids might even like a bit of like physical punishment as weird as it sounds like, you know, some people that's, <laughs> yeah, they, but some people's more like, it's more of a threat to others, right? Like you can even yeah. threaten some people with like other things, like, like you're just saying, like taking away specific rights they had yeah etc um but yeah no, i thought that was really really interesting especially about like basically making if people 
police themselves is a lot easier than to police them by force, right? Like, yeah. well, that's how society roughly works, right? Because people yeah. tend to police themselves enough. And I guess that's what happens when you have a really cor- corrupt society over time. It basically doesn't police itself in a way that's productive. And eventually everybody just cheats because everybody else is cheating. Yeah. And on that um, note, people influence themselves. And mm-hmm. that's what's interesting, right? It's like as soon as you com- uh, commit or invest in something, you're more likely to do it for yourself yeah. because you've already made that commitment. And he was saying that mm-hmm. he's like, you know, a lot of these salesmen, they'll provide the chance, they'll provide the environment so that you can make a commitment or investment. But once you've made the first step, they like, pull yeah, it out and you can do it on your own. It's um, you know, it's interesting. There's plenty of marketing people who do stuff like that. So there's like a, a digital marketing funnel, like click funnels where they do like, the first commitments like they say buy my book will will you'll get it for free just pay the shipping and you've committed yeah. then to buying the book and then you sort of like that commitment then leads you into probably committing later on to the other products yeah. and it 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 also reminds what else it also reminds oh, yeah he made a point i think in the new edition where like on websites sometimes you know how you have to fill out forms with your information yeah they have one that's a really easy form so you fill it and you press next you to the next page and because you've already committed you're more likely to follow through so instead yeah. of seeing like a 10 page, you know, form, which you don't want to bother yeah. filling out because you've done the first bit initially, you then you've made the commitment and then you want to like, it's like the habit thing as well, isn't it? Like you, you take yeah. that first step, the first commitment, like the first commitment of putting on your gym clothes, you're 10 times more likely to go to the gym because you've done the first step or like you've already made the decision to do something related to it. Um, yeah, no, exactly. exactly. Which I find like, yeah, the best way to do any task ever is to like, what's the first action that you need to do to do the task? Even if it's like, get up a website, just get it up on a browser and then you'll do yeah. it because it's up. Yeah. Cause it's there in front of you. Exactly. If it's not there in front of you, you can't do it. So yeah. Um, no, exactly. Yeah. Um, so then how do we say no to this one, Jess? Yes. So what have we got here? Two signals. Are t- okay. I like this one's a bit more airy fairy, isn't it? Looking at this. I thought so uh, as well. Actually. Yeah. Like, yeah. I would like to believe that that's all that it takes, but, um, yeah. yeah. Two signals that tip us off in the pit of our stomachs. When we realize we are trapped into complying and listen to our heart and internal gauge. I think interestingly enough. Yeah. The first bit's a bit more interesting rather than listening to the heart slash internal gauge. You can mm-hmm. kind of tell when somebody's manipulated you into like a commitment thing, uh, because you're right. You kind of feel that almost pang, like the stomach of embarrassment. So like, yeah, yeah. the specific example I got from this in terms of like the way people use commitments to get people into corners is for example, to be like, ask you loads of questions. So you say stuff like, Oh, I'm really interested. I think the example we gave was like, I'm really interested in the cinema. I'm really interested in doing this. I'm really interested in doing this. And then the salesperson went, Oh, cause you're somebody who's interested in that. I've got this perfect deal where, you know, every, everything that you could possibly want is here in like a gift card yeah. or something. Yeah. And you kind of know because you feel a bit like, oh fuck's sake, they've just played me. Like you do, you yeah. do have a level of feeling like I've been put into a trap here because yeah. they were just letting me say everything to the point where I've now been jujitsu and I feel like a bit of an ass. I feel like maybe yeah. that's a good sign. If you feel like you're being a bit of an ass, you yeah. you probably yeah have been manipulated. Um, well, no, exactly because I think you know obviously if you engage your like rational brain then you can probably be like oh i probably shouldn't do this right or that was a mistake you know so you learn from your behavior most of the time we don't engage that but then on the opposite side it's like well listen to your kind of emotions because i think the reason why he says you know listen to your heart and um you know the feeling in your stomach is we have our vagus nerve that connects all of those muscle uh, all of those organs together and that gets triggered first right and we should, and that's like a signal to, for us to then think about it. And I think that's the idea, isn't it? It's like first, it's like okay, this feels a bit weird. Maybe I should think yeah. about whether this guy is trying to cheat me or not. You know, and use that as a trigger. Um, yeah, you fine. Yeah, use it as a trigger to become more sort of conscious of it as it's happening. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, I think um, in the new edition, he said like call them out. <laughs> He'd be like, I know what you're yeah. trying to do. You're trying to manipulate me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you imagine Stay the poor back. old the poor old scout cookie girl? Like, I'm not trying yeah, to do yeah. I know what you're trying to do. You're the devil spawn. Yeah. Um, oh, that's funny. But yeah, so that uh, that was probably not the best, not the best how to say no. I think I guess. Yeah. Yeah, just trying to, you know, use those like inner gauges to try and figure out whether you are being manipulated, and maybe just yeah, realizing it is what it is, and 
having the balls to say no, I guess, and peer inconsistent. Maybe feeling feeling or being conscious of the fact that being inconsistent is going to make you feel uncomfortable, but be doing it anyway. Like trying to drive that uncomfort muscle, so to speak. Yeah. Because nobody yeah. likes appearing inconsistent. Do I was thinking I mean? about this the other day, actually. I was thinking, I wonder if, you know, with like um, Marcus Aurelius and how he um, he used to write his like visions in the morning or like, you know, as in like what he would see himself doing throughout the day and then he would reflect on it at night. And I wonder if a way of getting out of this is like, may, it might not be instant, but it might ah. be like a reflective process and so you go over it's like what decisions did i make today and how did that impact my behavior and should i just you know next time be a bit more aware when i'm going yeah i was going to even say maybe even reflecting on the fact that the stuff you said you were going to do at the beginning of the day you didn't do so therefore you're just not consistent yeah yeah because yeah. I, I i really do feel that in general maybe it's just me but if i was to reflect every single thing that i've ever done in my life Oh, and write down what was the intention, what was the result, yeah. how many times did I actually stick to the apparent consistency that I apparently have, and you'd see it's very little. And then I just, yeah. then you just think like, most most people must have that problem. Hence why we, you know, everybody drops, you know, new diets within, you know, what two weeks, whatever it is. Like yeah. New Year's resolutions remain undone because I think genuinely we are all very fucking inconsistent. Yeah. <laughs> like, and that is, uh, yeah, I agree. that is pretty much why do we need these things to keep us consistent i think you know we actually literally need people to help us be consistent yeah no i agree um so yeah but yeah you can um i think it's yeah it's a lot more easier to appear consistent than to process, be consistent but, yeah yeah <laughs> yes yeah um all right so the next one is social proof so how are we doing actually quickly proof. one second well yeah. are we halfway there are we i think so yeah we've oh done my God, three. Not. Well, three. No, that's three isn't it yeah reciprocity oh we have done three and um no we haven't done two have we we're in oh god let's go let's go oh, right. i knew this would be an absolute beast yeah this this um, is a beast um okay proof. so social proof the principle of social proof states that one means we um that one means we use to determine what is correct is to find out what other people think is correct. The principle applies especially to the way we decide what constitutes correct behavior. We view behavior as more correct in a given situation to the degree that we see others performing it. Yes. Um, so yeah, it's basically we gauge what to do based on how others behave, um, mm -hmm. especially in I think one of the main things that you mentioned is like ambiguity and uncertainty, isn't it? Um, I quite like this point you wrote in right below it. As a rule, we will make fewer mistakes by acting in accord with social evidence than contrary to it. So it provides a convenient shortcut for determining how to behave. I quite like that because it's true. On average, yeah. if you just copy what everybody else is doing, you're going to behave in a way. Well, first of all, that's acceptable, I guess, because everybody else mm -hmm. looks around to see what's acceptable. But in a way that, you know, most people would, I guess, argue is the correct way to behave right i guess this is almost how stuff gets ingrained into like culture and stuff it's just yeah. repetitive behavior that people then just accept as you know the way things are done right this is the classic status quo v's you know innovation argument like you get stuck the into ways is, you see everybody else doing it a specific way right yeah the thing is is that like all of these are basically heuristics or shortcuts and most of the time they do work out it's just sometimes mm -hmm. You know, but yeah, that's people it. People try work to take out, advantage, right? Yeah, or, exactly. Yeah, yeah, people take advantage. That's it. It's you know, noticing when people are trying to use it for their own, you know, n nefarious, I guess, or just looking to use it for their own benefit at the expense yeah. of you. Yeah. Um, no, exactly. Um, but actually, what I thought was quite interesting is that they said that you could eliminate undesirable or maladaptive um, behaviors. Such like okay. it's like phobias or fears, because you can watch other people doing things that you don't like to do yes. and know that it's possible to like, you know, incur those like, you know, do those behaviors yeah. and they're fine. And you live. Yeah, but interestingly it's enough, fine. isn't that why, okay, you people love those like rags to riches stories? Like, do you kind of yeah, get what I mean? Like probably, they can yeah. do it. 
Like, not in a way that's like, it's kind of separate to phobias, but it's more like the average Joe goes and becomes a superhero and wins. People love those movies because they can, like, like you just said, sort of see other people achieving or surpassing themselves, if that makes sense. A bit like, yeah. oh, I'm scared of snakes and I see somebody else surpassing it, therefore I can get the yeah. courage because I've seen somebody else doing it. People look to others for these stories of, like, overcoming hurdles because it's like, oh, I have these hurdles and I want to overcome them too. And yeah. I don't know, it's just a thought off, off the cuff. No, but it actually, no, kind it's, of it's very interesting. And I wonder if, depending on where someone is in relation to where that person has come from, so if someone's all, like inherits loads and they haven't done anything to earn it, and yeah. yet they watch someone who's come up from, you know, from nothing, from pure poverty, and is at the same stage as them, I wonder if they resent them because 100%. they weren't able to do anything like they just no had to got given it. And the same thing is like we judge people who were worse off than us and now do better than us. And we come up with all these like reasons why, why, oh, well, this happened and that happened. Well, it's why some of like the biggest like envy and slash jealousy happens when it's somebody in your own sort of uh, space, right? It's like they say something like academics like hate other academics in their own sort of uh, discipline who do really well because like, oh, I can't believe they're doing really well. I'm doing exactly what they're doing they're wrong or whatever yet they've got all the fame and fortune or whatever um i'm sure there's plenty of people out there who are like psychologists who are equally as smart as people like jordan peterson and stuff but haven't got the renowned fame that he does and probably resent him for it if not oh yeah yeah and that would be because yeah they're they're more just thinking how does a person like him who's so similar to me do so much better than me yeah that that was it there was a quote so recent which is like the world's not driven by jealousy or something it was driven by envy i thought it was quite perceptive and i wonder whether if you start viewing things through that lens it might make more sense because a lot of it a lot of stuff i'm like surprised striving i wouldn't be it's definitely a human motivation or human characteristic or recurring characteristic yeah but yeah. yeah um no but it was interesting like what they were saying um in terms of uh what is it it's like the more similar someone is to you the more likely it's going to affect your behavior And I think they even said that, like, you know, watching videos influences people as well. So, like, watching people of like who look similar to you um, influences your behavior as well. Which, what I was thinking, it'd be quite interesting. Then, is could you design like customized videos based on people and what they want to do? So, like, think about like getting a doppelganger. And they'll be like, this person was able to achieve yeah. this. Like, you can even oh, change their name to your your name as well. I've got a yeah. weird feeling that having the same name as the person in the video might even doubly affect yeah. how you believe. Like how, yeah. like, oh, there's a person called Jesse to overcome it as well. Fantastic. Yeah. It's weird that yeah, these things would weird, affect right? it, but yeah. I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would have an effect. And it's like what characteristics, like, are uh, influence, right? Is it the same, same color hair, same type mm. of hair? Same color eyes. But people like, people what, look what for different thing things, right? Like, people yeah. look for different things. Like, um, I guess it just depends on what your like main characteristics are, right? Kind of thing, like, yeah. yeah. But it is it is uh, really something I didn't really realize that actually had that sort of effect that you could even treat somebody with phobia for just by watching somebody else who's similar to yourself overcome it. Yeah. Um, I'm looking here to see what we can talk about next in terms of this. We've got the uncertainty and similarity. Um, we've got a bunch of examples here, by the way, in terms of mm. like, you know, why sample or why, how, like how social proof works. I mean, you got here like the canned laughter and um, in comedy shows. I thought another quite interesting one was the fact that, oh, what's the name? The people who clap in operas. There's like a name for them. Oh, fuck. I can't remember God, the name. I've forgotten it. Like, but basically, yeah. they created their own industry where they literally just pay people to go into like operas and whatever theaters and clap um, yeah. to the point where people then appreciated it more. Because, like, it's like that classic, isn't it? Like, you walk into an art gallery, you don't know what the fuck you're doing, and you see a bunch of people looking at a painting, and then you must assume this painting's sick yeah. um, because you just see everybody looking at it. There's something about it. And it's the same thing here. Um, Oh yeah, that's another one. Advertisers use high demand as a way to rope people in. So I've heard of people like paying actors to stand outside of a shop to create a long list. In fact, I believe, and I don't know whether it was in this book, yeah. but Apple did it. Apple literally did it with their New York store to make it look like as if they're flying off the, sh- the shelves. Um, 
nightclubs do it they reduce the entry speed just so they have people going in slowly so they have more people standing outside can you remember the amount of times you used to like queue up for a club and you get in you're like it's dead like why yeah and and that is why yeah um, yeah bartenders doing putting tips it's in their jar already it? because like we're so influenced by whether we're fitting in or not because if we don't and we're just an individual we're not part of the collective then we've got a low life of living and survival um that's so the nature what of our reality isn't it we like, want to be individual yeah. but at the same time we want to be we want to be part of the collective yeah like and that's the thing is like you know we want to be seen as we're doing the same as everyone else but what if everyone else isn't doing the right thing right and it's like you know we want to fit in but there's also other times where you know we just don't know what to do so we follow others you know and that's where like he like the two conditions was ambiguity and uncertainty um for one of them and just how easily like when we have no idea what to do we look to others as like a role model in a sense um to gauge what to do next and like he talked about that whole pluralist uh, pluralistic ignorance isn't it so what is it yeah I've got a note here was it uh we are likely to overlook the important fact and wait a minute because we all prefer to appear poised and unflustered amongst others we are likely to search for that evidence placidly so basically when we don't know what to do and we look to uh, look to see what others are doing we do it really placidly so so that we're almost camouflaged so that people mm. can't like pick us out and be like he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing um but what's ironic is that if we are all uh, if we are likely to overlook the important fact that those people are probably examining the social evidence too then this is what is called pluralistic ignorance yeah yeah like everyone yeah. is like let's all look at everyone else to do yeah. to figure out what we should do but everyone is doing that so no one knows what the fuck to do um, it's also like another word for it, it's called the bystander effect isn't it or is it this is like another i guess i think that's when it occurs in the context yeah okay yeah where yeah i think the example was somebody was literally getting murdered wasn't it or was it raped it was, well, it was either way it's not it very nice yeah. oh, it was some girl was getting murdered like broad daylight or something like this and yeah sure not like not visible because obviously i feel like if it was visible people might not have, might have done something but basically she was like screaming yeah. so people could hear somebody screaming going like get off me he's yeah. gonna kill me or stuff like that and nobody did anything because everybody else just saw everybody else doing nothing and just assumed <laughs> somebody was handling it which yeah, is absolutely sorry. crazy yeah. um but you know what? It, it reminds me actually because I've just come back from Paris, and in the mm-hmm. tube there was this guy who was absolutely going nuts. Um, he was basically saying like, "Oh, like stop looking at me, you bitch," and stuff like that. Like just basically shouting like a really volatile person. And I just found why it so fascinating. I know. I uh, it's basically somebody. He was. Why was I looking at him? I wasn't looking at him. This is my point. <laughs> and nobody would meet him in eye contact. Everybody mm. in the train was like literally doing the same thing you're saying, like looking at each other, like, "What do we do?" Like everybody's just like looking at each other, like yeah don't don't like don't look at this guy because actually half of what he's saying by the way apparently was like don't look at me like stop staring at me like yeah so somebody was staring at him but the rest of us are all just like oh god oh no but like, oh, I, I feel like that's an example of it where realistically i don't know somebody should just get up and tell him to shut the fuck up but obviously you just don't know these types of people anyway yeah but uh it's just that level of like nobody really knows how to act and because nobody's yeah. doing anything everybody just like stays there doing nothing yeah it's uh yeah it was a bizarre situation it kind of made me think of the book a little bit um, yeah no, this absolutely. is where like, an alternative reality i get up and i get beaten up <laughs> <You know? laughs> I try, try and do the right thing but it, it, no but it is like it's such a weird phenomenon this whole you know no one's you know you just think everyone else is is unsure so they're yep. looking to you but you're unsure as well so Two, yeah who's the one who's gonna, like, which is why leaders almost like, like the classic like yeah. courageous people because they stand up and they take they take may make decisions right in my head like a leader is somebody who can show that they'll make decisions and not follow the, sh- the crowd whereas yeah. a lot of people are just happy to just go along with the ride right like, that's yeah. why they talk about like wolves and sheep to a degree it is kind of yeah. like that because not many people would be yeah. willing to be the first person to make a move does that make sense or yeah. not, not many people would be willing the first person to go down a path that's not been trodden down before yeah. people just people like to follow the the well-worn path because it's easier right everybody else has done it it's they, they like to be told what to do don't they at the end of the day yeah. it's much it's much easier than figuring it out for yourself and using cognitive like resources to actually like rationally think it's much easier yeah. to know the path 
Um, but it is interesting because like one of the two of the um, conditions that they say why this bystander effect occurs and like why a bystander wouldn't help in an emergency is that one, the personal responsibility is split between how many people are there. If there's like in this case, I think there were 38 people, 37 people that, you know, didn't help her when she was running down the street screaming that she was getting murdered. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it means that it's split 38 times because you know that there's 37 other people that could all call the police. So would you call the police as well? That's not effective, blah, blah, blah. But then the second um, condition is that it may not always be seem obvious that it's an emergency. And so that's the ambiguity. That's the uncertainty because that's the kind of, I think a lot of it comes down to that kind of plausible deniability. You can be like, well, I didn't know that it was a um you know an emergency we have people screaming on the street all the time but they're you know i don't know why you would but like maybe in a different like context but um i think that's why a lot of people are like oh i i don't know i didn't know what to do i wasn't really sure um and i think when he mentions in this chapter like how to say no or how to improve on this bystander effect is i think he gives an example doesn't he someone like having a heart attack at like a yeah. festival and you know that or having a stroke or something something like that and instead of just being like help you need to like point directly at someone because then yeah. that's like first of all the the responsibility is only like purely on that one person so they feel obliged to help but on top of that if you say what's happening is in like i'm having a heart attack or this is an emergency then it's like okay well then you've ticked both those boxes um I quite like. I was just yeah. thinking about the use of how I do this to somebody in the tram. But like you, are you going to sort this guy out? <laughs> Can you imagine? Yeah. You are you going to tell this guy to shut up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. But it, I tell you what is like an example of that is when you get on the tube, right? And yeah. people haven't stood up to allow like a really old person to sit down. And yeah, you be like, hey, are you going to get up? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a good example. You finally put the responsibility on them, and you, you then basically put them in a position where if they say no, they're a really bad person. Yeah. So the majority yeah. of the time, they're going to get up, aren't they? Um, it's interesting. What else do we have? Yeah, yeah. What else do we have on this note? People, don't really go um, I mean, we could go into this like mass suicide, but I don't really know. Yeah, what did you, the mass what, I didn't suicide. get much from that, but um... <sighs> no, I'm looking here. Like, I'm just trying to remember what I personally got from it. It was to do with that. Obviously, all of them just, but I think it was from a different book where I'm thinking about this, where he talks about how they were all secluded, or maybe it was his book. He was talking about this guy was like a master persuader because he had them all yeah. secluded. So they had no other social proof. So like they'd already like given up on all their friends and family. So this was a ma- this was a cult based in like a remote location. So they, well, they literally moved had to a yeah. remote location. So they, they had no other rubber, social proof. Yeah. So they had nobody else to like tell them what they were doing was completely wrong. Yeah. They were all just like in this trance, I guess you could say. And that was like the point being like that's like the ultimate form of social proof is when there's nobody else to like compare like or to look for social proof to. I guess this reminds me a bit of like this like role model, like looking up to your hero type thing is like people achieving great things. You can use the like, you can look at them as social proof of like, oh my God, you can do this. Like it's a possibility a bit like yeah. the four minute mile, like somebody doing it, yeah. it gives you the proof that it, it can happen. Whereas possible, yeah. if you're completely secluded, the only social proof you have is that immediate group, which is why this led to like a mass suicide. Because when they all decided it'd be a good idea to kill themselves, they none of them could be like, oh, maybe it's not a good idea because they had no other social proof to like say, oh, there's an alternative. Yeah. Um I think that was kind of the point, if I remember it. Yeah. And because uh, he he was talking about like, you know, if you're in a bubble and you mm. have no outside perspective, then you know, things like issues can come about and they just snowball into larger and larger effects because think about it, it's like group think isn't it it's like everyone's agreeing on it because no one know like there's no outside perspective mm-hmm. um no one's set no one's challenged the behavior especially if the group. social proof becomes like a good evil battle right well we're the good guys everybody yeah. else is the bad guys you know yeah. well you don't want to see it be seen like you know you're you don't agree with people if the whole yeah, group yeah. is all acting in the same way um yeah no absolutely i think that's crucial but did he give a reason like how to say no or was it just like being more the, 
Yeah, something like we got a good one here. So we need to look up and around peri- periodically whenever we are locked into the crowd. That's quite mm. interesting, just to sort of like, I guess more like when you're in a crowd, start thinking like outside of it. I don't know. Yeah. It's hard, isn't it? It's, you requires a level of like self awareness and consciousness, I guess, when you're within yeah. a group of people to be like, "Hey, am I am I doing this because somebody else is?" I, no, I'll give you another example. When I was in Paris as well, I we were walking down a street and then there was like a roadblock because I, I was just thinking of this book when we were doing it. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. Down this bit, like where the uh, you know, like they put like uh, cones out, to sort of like identify yeah. where you should walk, and we started walking down this route two random people who weren't to do with us started walking down this route, even though I had an inkling that that wouldn't be, it wasn't an open route the other end. Uh, and yeah. we went back on it. It's just so funny to see their shocked faces of like, oh my God, they're like, this isn't a route to go down. Like, cause yeah, they yeah. just willing, like they just basically seen other people walk in that direction. Yeah. Gone. Yeah, it's fine. And it's amazing yeah. to think that if there was like a trap hole somewhere in a really popular city where people were just like getting killed because there's like a hole in the floor, people would just yeah. walk into it like lemons because they wouldn't realize. Obviously, you'd hear the screams yeah. and stuff. But yeah. you would literally just like follow people into the bloody the abyss. Well, the, you just, yeah, and there's, yeah, so, you, there's so many examples. I think about when you're like going into a place and people all queuing in one line and you're like, it, is that line closed? Yeah, no, you know, it's a good like, point actually. Yeah, you've already just brought up another one. There was a ho- there was a hotel bar we were looking at to go to, and the bar was on the top floor, and there's people just queued yeah. outside by the hotel. Yeah, and we couldn't figure out whether because nobody was coming out to let them in or out, so we just skipped yeah. the whole queue, just walked in, and yeah. then we asked somebody, they're like, "Oh, you can't get in," but like we at least we got that confirmation. Whereas these other people just queuing outside, of which they didn't. I don't yeah, think yeah. they knew whether that they were what they were queuing for. Like it was just so yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's an weird. example of it where people just do it because other people are doing it. It's just like you see it and you're just like, oh, well, I'll join this queue. Well, you had another good uh, example of like when people were changing lanes in traffic okay. and how the front car will indicate to change lane, right? Yes. But then the one behind that will think, well, maybe he's changing lane for a reason that he can ah, see and that okay. I can't. So I'm going to start changing lane. And then the person behind yeah. that just starts changing lane because he's... That's, that's a contagion effect, lane. isn't it? That's like the classic yeah. like social proof contagion where yeah. like you mindlessly follow without ever thinking about the, 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 like, the primary reason. But I think mindlessly is like a good point there because in this example... But- you pull yeah. out just because everyone else is doing it and then bam, a car comes along and I, like, hits you. I guess the uh, examples of well in France, like nine times out of 10, the queue exists for a reason. The yeah. the walking yeah. in that direction is the right way to walk. But obviously sometimes it doesn't. It's just funny to see. Like they were visibly shocked. I remember seeing their face go, fucking hell, like we can't walk this way. Like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not, when they saw us like turn direction, they'll be like, whoa, what are they doing? Like they're crazy people. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was the only thing I could think of. Like the, uh, the trying to be, self-aware and conscious of yeah. uh the group of the crowd i guess i guess things. part of it could be literally after listening to this go out and watch watch people just see why cues are forming or like see why yeah. people are behaving in certain ways yeah. or if you want to have some fun walk down a no a no way street and watch people follow you especially if there's a big group yeah. of you it's quite fun have you seen those um have you seen those funny videos of like Peter, like a person will be waiting at like a doctor's room and then okay. there'll be like two confederates and they'll okay. just like stand up randomly. Okay. And so then the other person feels like he has to stand up. Yes. And no, it's like, and they just fuck ones with like him in like the, the whole ele- time. Have you seen it? Like in the lifts, like in the elevator. Yeah, or whatever. they turn. Like a lift. Yeah, yeah. And they face one way and then everybody slowly turns around to face the way. <laughs> it's it's so like, funny. oh, I have to say, I probably, I, I would 100% turn the way as well. I'm just like, because you just feel so pressured in yeah. that moment. Like, yeah, yeah. It, it's also, something you, you assume that they might know something that you don't. That you don't. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's an important like fact is like you want to be in the know because if it's anything that like jeopardizes your survival. Um, but yeah, it is quite funny. <laughs> I was going to say another one you could do if you're really mm-hmm. fancy it. We were talking about it before is if you've got a view and a group of mates, let's say there's about four or five of you just stand up like in a street, just all look in the same direction up in the sky and see how many people stop <laughs> yeah. stop like come by and stop by you and look up as well or at least or well, at least fine maybe they don't stop but at least they will all check people yeah. will 100 percent check where you're looking yeah there's no doubt was there in the book was it i can't remember if it was this book and there was like um an animation like a drawing like a comic drawing and it was like everyone okay. was doing that so they were like one person was looking up then a bunch of others joined and then they were like looking at like um, uh, an angel and then the angel looked up as well. <laughs> <Quite> <laughs> funny. 
<laughs> I don't know if it was in it might have been in that book I, I, I didn't that's actually Quite fucking funny. hilarious I like that yeah um, um sick well that's social proof we'll move we'll move on then because we have we got, we got left do you want to split authority. this or it's up to you man like we already that, that's that's a decent podcast later we're at an hour and a half now um I think we actually. split it to be honest um, yeah and then do the other three principles after yeah I'm happy to do that I just think, okay. I mean, it's going to probably take another hour, isn't it, to get through this? It's already nine o'clock. I haven't eaten dinner. Uh, yeah, no, um, yeah, I think so. Um, so you would do that. Well, okay, beautiful. Next to next time, everybody, we'll do the remaining three yeah. then. Well, there you have it, guys, the first half of Influence by Robert Ciardini. Now, this book has some great takeaways, so if you want to be able to implement them, head on over to our website at wisewords.blog, and it will all be there waiting for you. Now, next week, we will be summarizing the second half of this book, which contains the remaining three principles, so make sure you stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, please show us some love by giving us a like, leaving us a comment, or subscribing to our channel. It really does make all the difference. But until next week, we hope you have.